I want to move on and talk about grief in adolescence and this also applies some of it to children as well. Grief tends to happen in starts and stops. It, and that is especially true in children and adolescents. So there can be periods of eruption and periods of calm. One minute the teenager or child can seem perfectly fine, no issues, and the next minute they are hysterical over something that seems completely insignificant. That does happen with adults, but <laughs> children and teenagers don't always have um, the developmental filters that adults do, so you see this more with children. And what can happen is that people think, oh, the kid's fine. That like doesn't even, didn't even phase, didn't even phase the kid. Just because someone is acting fine, that they are fine, is a mistake. So something to remember about grief also is that there is no closure. There is no resolution. I remember one mom telling me, I will never accept the death of my child because it's not acceptable. And I think that's, I think that's really important to remember. Like, it is not acceptable that people have to endure the kinds of losses that they do, and we should not judge them because it seems like they haven't accepted it. What, what does that even mean, anyway? So there is no closure. There's no resolution. What there is is finding a new normal. The other thing about grief is that grief can be transformative. It can change us in ways we didn't want, but that can be very meaningful. Um, I want to read you a couple of quotes. These are from people who have experienced grief. Sometimes I still cry with missing her, but I have embraced my life. I have become a better, kinder, more forgiving person. And another one. I just live so my life is a testament to that love and so they can be proud of the heritage that they left behind. Grief is very difficult and it's very difficult to watch somebody going through grief. But I know from having worked with families that have experienced the worst loss that a person can experience that people can and do come out the other side and that grief can be transformative and people are changed in ways they didn't want to but that do add meaning to their life and stand as part of a legacy for someone who is gone. For those of us who are trying to help people that are grieving, I want to say that grief is not a problem to be solved. It's something that we all learn to live with, that we can't fix grief unless you have some special powers that I do not have um, or a magic wand. We can't fix it, but what we can do is help people live, learn to live with the loss and live with their grief. But I, I guess I can't really even say this enough. We can't we cannot help people until we stop trying to fix it. So with an understanding of grief, what is normal, what's expected, we can move on to talking about grief and adolescence. And oh my gosh, I don't know many people that would love to go back and be a teenager again. Um, grief is especially hard when one is an adolescence. So, you, I mean, you know, adolescence is a time when we are trying to find our identity, we're trying to find meaning, we're trying to figure out who we are, and it's, it's just such a, uh, a challenging age. We're, we're pushing off against our family, usually, and there are already changes in relationships. There, adolescence is a time that is stormy and chaotic. Adolescence is a time when there are 
I mean, think about it. There are physical changes. There are social changes. There are spiritual changes. There are cognitive changes. There are uh, all the things that we just talked about with grief. They're already there as an adolescent. They're already struggling with this. They're already, adolescents are already trying to find their new normal. And so when you layer grief on top of adolescence, it's an amplification of both. So if you think about it, you, you're taking two similar things, grief and adolescence, and you're putting it together. It just makes everything so much bigger. One of the things that is very common, and not just in teenagers, but also adults and children, is that the grief uh, precipitates increased anxiety and fear because it's really, you, you know that bad things happen. It's real, something bad happened. And so it makes you nervous that something else bad is gonna happen. So I worked with a, a young person who lost half of um, her friend's family were killed in a car accident. And of course, she was an, a wreck about her own family being in a car and would text or call her mother constantly, like literally sometimes four or five times in a minute to make sure she was still okay. I mean, that level of anxiety, if you didn't know what was normal for grief, you might think there was something really wrong with that child. There wasn't, that's normal, that's grief. That increased fear and anxiety is a normal reaction to grief and loss. And if you understand it as normal, that doesn't mean you don't do something about it. Of course you do, but you don't further pathologize somebody's very normal response to a loss. So in, with grieving teens, you may see more fear. You may see more anxiety. They have an awareness that bad things do happen. Something that I think might be unique to teenagers, or at least more prevalent in teenagers in grief, is that they tend to hide their losses in order to fit in. I did a study of people who had experienced the loss of a parent before they were 18. And I will always remember this one respondent telling me about how her mom died when she was about 16. And a few months later, one of her friends said to her, it seems like you don't even care that your mom died. And that was because this young person, and she wasn't young when she told me this, she was in her 50s, and she still remembered it. She was trying so hard to fit in with her friends and to not be different. And what that looked like to other people was that she didn't care about her mom. It's a good reminder that, boy, people sure have ideas about what grief should look like, right? So. It's really uh, typical for grieving teens to perhaps try hard not to show. They don't want to be different. I mean, the thing about teenagers is that they're trying so hard to, to be the same, right, as their peers. They don't want to be different. And so they might not show their grief in a way that we might expect them to. The other sort of related, but maybe a little bit different, is that grieving teens may socially isolate. And this is because they do feel different and they don't feel like people are understanding. And similar to what I said earlier in the social aspects of grief, it might be really difficult for them to be engaged with normal teenage activities when they don't really, they don't have the bandwidth to be doing those things. They don't, they're not, in their heads, what's swirling around is the loss. Maybe they were removed from, from their home or lost a foster care placement or a friend committed suicide. And that's what's swirling around in their heads, not who's dating who or which teacher is, you know, most hated. So grieving teens may socially isolate and that that's normal. And again, just because something's normal doesn't mean that we don't try to intervene. It's not necessarily a good thing to socially isolate, but it is an understandable thing. Maybe I should say that, understandable. That's an understandable symptom of grief. Teenagers that are grieving can sometimes have issues with control. Their loss is out of their control. They, there are all the associated losses that are out of their control. 
but they maybe could control how much they eat <laughs> or they could control um, they could be really controlling in the family uh, with rules or um, you know I, I want to drive I have to drive no you can't drive uh, yes I'm driving because I, I want to drive I, I once had a teen say you know I do I want to do the driving because then I feel like I'm in control and if you think about all the things that all the all the loss of control that losses that losses um, generate it makes a lot of sense that a teenager would be trying to control the things that he or she could control and again understandable very understandable another Another thing that we can see with teens who are grieving is that they have an enhanced awareness that life is not fair. Now, I think most kids and teens and adults understand that life is not fair, but it's not really up close and personal most of the time. But when something bad happens, it really strikes you that life is not fair, which precipitates for some a big spiritual crisis. What, what the heck? I mean, I, I am a, I'm doing everything right and this happens? That's not fair. And so adolescents have um, that ability. They're in that period where they're trying to make sense and make meaning of things. When you have some bad stuff happen when you're a teenager, it really complicates an already complicated process of trying to make meaning and figure out what the heck about life. So an enhanced and understanding and awareness that life is not fair, very normal for a grieving teenager. Now, teenagers are already pretty volatile, most teenagers. <laughs> you add grief onto that and yeah, they're Grieving teenagers can be very volatile. And since teenagers don't typically do this, like, oh, I'm just having such a rough day today and I really want to talk to you about this and how I'm feeling, that's not what you get usually from a teenager. What you get is kaboom, right? Like one little thing and the whole house of cards comes tumbling down. And so, you know, as, as an adult or a parent or a professional, you're like, whoa, okay, you just, your pencil broke. Well, it wasn't about the pencil. But they're, they're like, a grieving teen is on their last straw all the time. And so they're very volatile, super normal, super understandable. The other thing about grieving teens is that they may experience past losses in new ways and this can concern parents and helpers. So I did grief groups and I had a parent, a dad and a stepmom bring a 13 year old boy to the grief group because he was starting to have issues about his mom who committed suicide when he was an infant. Okay, well that illustrates some really important concepts. Number one, uh, we experience losses throughout our life as we understand them in new ways. Totally normal. I mean, you can imagine that was kind of freaking the dad out, like his mom's been dead for 13 years. Why is he just now having issues? Well, because he's 13 and developmentally, he's understanding much more about what it means to have your mom die and to have your mom commit suicide. Like, what, what is that about? So very, very normal to experience losses throughout your life. That's for all, everyone. Adults, teens, children. The other thing that's illustrated by that example is the importance of knowing about normal development. Children and teenagers understand loss and death and grief in different ways as they proceed through their developmental lifetime. And so how it's understood at age six is gonna be really different at age 16. And the loss, it is a new loss because I didn't understand it like that when I was six, but I understand it now. And when you're 26 and, you're, and you say to yourself, oh, actually, my mom will not be here at my wedding. Like, you don't think about that necessarily at, 20, at 16, but you will at 26 in a different way. And so that's why it's really normal for people to grieve across a long period of time and to grieve different aspects of that 
what appeared to be a single loss. So that's going to happen with a teenager. When they have one loss, they're going to be looking back and they're going to be thinking about other ones and, and it could all come piling on. And that would be, there's that word again, normal, understandable. As I already said, teenagers are not always great at, well, I mean, come on, adults aren't great at this. Identifying very clearly, I am feeling this, and here is my appropriate way of expressing it to you. Like, okay, that doesn't always happen. Even if you're, even if you're really good at this, it, it just doesn't. And so to expect that a teenager is, is going to use words and appropriately and accurately express emotions or experiences, okay, that you're, that's la-la land, that's not real life. The truth is that teenagers, adolescents who are grieving may use behavior and not words to express emotions or may express words, may use words that, that are not really about the, the thing that's most upsetting. So we, we have to be understanding with a grieving teen. I worry about this. I worry about, oh, we label things as behavior issues when it's not a behavior issue, it's an expression. And it's a teenager. They don't have the skills and the tools to use words. So they're using behavior and we're gonna label it as something bad? I, that's concerning to me as a professional. Teenagers, oh, especially if there's a death, may experience an awful lot of guilt and anger about around their grief, around the loss. And I'm gonna give you an example. Um, I saw a teenage boy. He was, when I saw him, he maybe was 15. And he came in, his dad brought him in. He was struggling so much because his mom had died in a car accident and he was feeling guilty because he hadn't been very nice to her always. And that's how he expressed it. It's like, I wasn't always polite. I wasn't always nice to her. And, you know, I, I was sassy. I mean, he just, he was describing normal teenage behavior and he felt so guilty. And and of course, this was over a couple of, of times with him, but basically what I helped him to understand was, wow, you gave your mom a gift that nobody else could have ever given her. And that was to say, you gave her the gift of being the mother of a normal teenager. Like that, that was a gift. And you know, she died before she could see you be an adult but she got the experience of having a teenage son and you you were the only one who could give that to her and you did and that helped um, and of course we also talked about all the all the wonderful things that he did with his mom but helping him understand that yeah that's what teenagers do and and when you're the mother of a teenager you know, it's kind of cool to get to be the mother of a teenager. And so, but you could see, you know, teenagers have complicated relationships with family members. And so if one of them dies, very understandable that it would be especially difficult to lose a significant person as a teenager. And then I want to go back to something I said earlier about families and grief. Being a teenager in a grieving family is super difficult. And the reason it's difficult is because, let's say you lose a sibling. You didn't just lose your sibling. You lost your entire normal life. Your parents are gonna be grieving. Grieving parents, grieving parents are a mess. Understandably, of course, but it is really hard to be growing up in a home with grieving parents. It's nobody's fault. And of course parents should grieve, but that doesn't mean we can't say out loud that it's really tough. And 
so a, a teenager that loses a sibling or a parent is dealing with their own grief, but they're having to do it in the context of a grieving home. And that is so hard. That is so hard for those kids. I want to read another quote. This is um, a young man who lost his mom and his grandma in less than six weeks when he was about 15. I felt guilty that I had not spent enough time with either of these mother figures, that I wasn't given the chance to say I love you and goodbye. On top of the guilt, I was angry at almost anyone I could think of, myself for not somehow preventing either death, my mother's doctor for taking her life away with prescribed zombie-inducing drugs, the driver of the train for not stopping sooner, or the transit company for not installing train crossing gates, God for allowing the whole mess to occur, and the list went on and on. That's pretty typical for how a, a teen would be thinking um, in grief and feeling. And you know, you can't talk someone out of their, out of their guilt. So what can you do? Let's talk about that. What can I do to help a grieving adolescent? First, you have to avoid the fix it attitude. This is not fixable. Unless you have resurrection powers or the magic wand, this is not fixable. And to have that attitude or approach is so dismissive and annoying to grieving people. So, and it's, it's not helpful. So I found it to be a strange paradox that when I stopped trying to fix things, I actually could be helpful. So I speak from experience. Avoid the fix-it attitude, very important. Second, understanding normal grief versus behavioral problems is so important. Think about it. If I assess a teenager as being a behavior problem, those interventions are very different than if I say, this adolescent is exhibiting these behaviors because of the losses that he or she has experienced. Those interventions are gonna look really different than behavioral problems. So if, you, so if you understand grief, and if you do an accurate assessment of a, of a kiddo, then our, our ability to help is gonna be so much more enhanced. In order to be effective in our interventions, we must understand normal grief. Another thing that helpers can do is to be mindful of normal development. It is, I, I hope that, I hope everybody understands that, is that <laughs> you have to understand what is normal and expected for a certain age. Otherwise, you could be way off base. Um, so if, a, if I told you, oh my gosh, somebody is running around um, running around outside without their clothes on, screaming and crying and throwing themselves on the ground. Okay, if it's a two-year-old, it's way different than if it's a 22-year-old, right? So understanding what is normal development is very important in helping grieving adolescents. And again, I want to emphasize that by knowing normal development, that helps in understanding differences between grief and behavioral problems. Another thing that's important is not to judge, and I alluded to this earlier, is that it can be really easy to say, wow, they don't even seem like they're bothered by this. Remember, you're judging on the outside. You can't see the inside self. And, and also, it's just not very useful to judge people. Very few people <laughs> want to change when they're feeling judged. So judging is not a good grief intervention strategy. We need to be really mindful and intentional in how we respond to loss and grief in adolescence because those experiences and that, those, those are lessons that they're gonna take forward into not only their reactions to other people in life when, when they are the ones who are providing comfort, <laughs> but also, they will internalize those. And so if we're dismissive of their feelings about grief, they will learn to, to hide those feelings and be dismissive of them in themselves. So I think, again, very important to remember, 
we don't get to decide what is grief worthy for another person. Only the person experiencing the loss gets to decide it. And also remember that the loss might, might be representative of other losses that have happened. So I'll give you another example. Um, I lost my mom when I was pretty young and she had a, she had a cat and uh, the person she was married to refused to give us the cat <laughs> so I don't think this is a crime so I'll tell you but um, so we went and got the cat because that was our connection to our mom and so we got the cat and she the cat Peaches lived with my sister until Peaches was 18 years old and when Peaches died we all had a big reaction about the death of this cat not only because we loved the cat, but because it was our last link to our mom. It felt like it, you know, but, and you don't always know that. So if I would have said to you, oh my gosh, I'm so sad. My mother's cat just died. And you'd be like, oh, I'm sorry. You probably wouldn't realize what the cat meant. So we should just assume that we don't really know what the loss means to another person. And if they're sad about it, if they're grieving it, Hey, put on your grief support, your best grief support and model those good behaviors. Another thing that helpers, teachers, parents, colleagues, anyone who wants to be a helper can do is to reduce the expectations and demands on a grieving teenager, a grieving person. Uh, remembering that they are not operating with full capacity and so we should not have the same expectations we would before. That is really important. And when we do that for a person, we also give permission for them to reduce demands on themselves. Really important. <sighs> Another one is to avoid platitudes. And I always hate talking about this because all of us have said them. And so once I start saying some, you're gonna start thinking, oh, I probably said that. Okay. We're none of us perfect at this grief thing. Platitudes are those things that we say to people that we really shouldn't say. That's the best way to, the way to describe it. A platitude is something like, well, at least they're not suffering anymore. As if there were only two choices, dead or suffering, right? Or, well, he's in a better place. There's a better place than here with me? Or, well, he's with Jesus now. What if someone doesn't believe in Jesus? Or really, G Jesus needed him more than I do? I mean, platitudes just are unfortunate things that we say and we're trying to be helpful and they're not helpful. Here's the best worst platitude ever. And that was when parents were told at a funeral, well, for their child, well, think of the money you're gonna save not sending him to college. Yes, that is true. The mother was keeping a list of all the terrible things that people said to her. So that, that was the winner. Um, the reality is, you know what? Some things don't have a silver lining and that's what a platitude is. You're like, here, look at this silver lining. No, there's no silver lining. And if there is a silver lining, I get to tell it to myself. So I get to find my own silver lining. I don't want you to tell me what the silver lining is. So we need to be really careful about not doing platitudes, especially to a teenager who is probably not going to say to you, you know, well, they might. That's the stupidest thing anyone's ever said. But you're also going to shut down communication because that's what platitudes do, too. It's, yeah, you don't understand. I'm not talking to you anymore about this. So, so what do you say? you say how sorry you are that it happened. It was in a book that I read that, um, and I can't remember who wrote it, but it was a quote that I'll never forget. And it was that a person dies twice, once a physical death and the second time is the last time someone says their name. We have a tendency to think that we shouldn't talk about losses or deaths, that we shouldn't talk to the bereaved about what has happened or the grieving person. 
And that's actually not accurate. It can be so wonderful for someone who's experienced a loss to be able to talk about it, to hear the name. Um, and we invite that when we just matter-of-factly talk about the person. So you might be working with a teenager and maybe the teenager's brother committed suicide and you say, you know, I remember when Jake was in this class and he did a, a drawing very similar to yours or he did a drawing of the M on the mountain and just like matter of fact conversation about about the person who died and you're not saying you know oh how are you feeling about this like which is a really dumb thing to say to anybody let alone a teenager but you're just matter of factly acknowledging that you know it happened and that you remember that person and the person mattered and there's no shame in in his existence his death or or the grief or anything and so just saying things out loud, just acknowledging it, or just saying, you know, I, I know his birthday's coming up, and I just want you to know I'm thinking of him, and I'm thinking about your family. Listening is another strategy for helpers. When we're doing all the talking, we're doing something wrong. So how do you get a, a teenager to talk? Um, well, you have to listen, but you might have to listen to a lot of stories about things that are, that maybe don't seem very important because you have to establish trust and rapport first. So I'll give you another example. I worked with, I still work with a teenager whose family experienced a really horrific death. And this teenager um, and I went to the Humane Society every week and petted cats and we did that for months and we just we talked about cats and we talked about the cats that were there and we and sometimes we talked about the person in the family who died but we petted cats and then we go we have coffee at Starbucks and we talk about school and we talk about this or that and that's how you get a teenager to talk is you build a relationship and you're trusted with things like cats and coffee and then maybe you'll be trusted with the hard stuff. The other, another strategy is to provide support. Support looks like all kinds of different things. It depends on the situation. The person receiving the support is the one that gets to decide if it's supportive or not. <laughs> and Teenagers are often really difficult to support because they have a very natural sort of wall. They're trying to establish their own identity. So their boundaries are not as permeable as perhaps um, someone who is older or someone who is younger would be. And, but that's not an excuse not to keep trying. And so we do, we build a relationship and we drink coffee or we pet cats or we talk about music, um, whatever the support looks like for that person. And if we get pushed back, if we get pushed back, we just keep trying and maybe we try something different. And then the other thing for helpers that's important is to also treat a grieving teenager um, normally. And that seems like a, wait, you said to dial back and all those other things. Yeah, I did. And to also have some normal, appropriate expectations and to not treat the person as if they have a, some terrible disease or they need all kinds of special care. It's still a teenager and still a person who has is trying really hard to have a life that isn't all about grief. And so when we provide normal, we're helping. We're helping with that. So let's talk about some very specific interventions that we can do with young people, adolescents and older children. 
educate them about what to expect from grief, both for themselves and for the people around them. So for instance, I have worked with families that experience a death of either a parent or a sibling. And the kids that I work with, I tell them, I, I tell them what to expect. So I will say, like to an adolescent, I'll say, okay, your parents are going to cry like a million tears. And that's just how it is. Like just expect it, get the Kleenex handy and give them Kleenex because they're gonna cry and cry and cry. And it's gonna be really hard. And if they know what to expect, it can be so helpful, so helpful. And you know, hey, people might be crabby, this might happen, whatever. If you educate normalized teens and children, it really does help. I did a grief group once. I will never forget this. And one of the kids, he was a nine-year-old boy, he tells the other kids, my parents cry all the time and it is so annoying. And all the other kids were like, yeah, oh yeah. And <laughs> if they just know that, yeah, just expect it. And let them know that it won't last forever, that can be a really helpful intervention. Education and normalizing are my go-to interventions for working with people that are grieving. Those are most important. Another thing that can be really helpful with kids in terms of an intervention is mindfulness and self-awareness. So you teach the kid about what are normal emotions for grief, what to do when they feel it coming on, um, how, to, uh, how to sit with it, how to just let it go through you, or in some way m expect and manage those difficult emotions. Practicing coping behaviors can be really helpful. I've actually worked with kids um, of what to say when somebody says, I'm really sorry about your sister. They don't always know what to say. And so actually helping them develop those skills can be really, really useful. The other thing is, uh, other ways to help them practice coping skills is to say, you know, hey, this is gonna be a really difficult time. It's gonna last for a few months. In the past, when you've had really difficult periods, what's helped? Well, you know, when I go play at my friend's house. Okay, so going and playing at your friend's house is something that can help you when you're having a really difficult time. What else helps? Well, I like to go in my room and listen to music. Okay, so going to a friend's house, going to your room and listening to music. Yeah, those things help. Okay, I would like you to practice those things at least one time this week each of those things one time, just practice them. Because we all know this, the worst time to practice a behavior is when you're in a crisis. You have to practice it and get good at it so it's really automatic and, and natural and that you can do it. So helping and encouraging and identifying uh, using coping strategies can be very effective with kids. Um, rituals can be really useful grief interventions with adolescents and younger kids. And that could be as simple as lighting a candle for an hour a day in honor of the person who is gone or, or that has happened or that is missing in some way. It could be that you um, plan a memorial service. It could be if, a, if it's a school event and somebody is no longer there, maybe there's some kind of a some kind of a group that gets together once a month and just talks about the person who is gone and the ideas for coping and how how everyone's doing i mean ritual anything that gives people space and time to rest their minds on what is lost and honor it can be really useful Capturing memories is something that is a great gift for kids and adolescents. It probably hurts all of our parental hearts to imagine that if we were gone when, when a child was 10, there's a lot that they may not remember very much about us. And so one of the things that when I work with families, I like to do is to encourage the capturing of memories. And that can look like writing down um, your favorite memories of your dad. I have one child who I worked with that um, he told, talked to me all about the pancakes that his dad made him. I mean, it, in great detail. And I served as a secretary, so I wrote it all down. And 
he was nine and now he's in his 20s. Like he would not remember the level of detail about those pancakes if we had not written those things down. And that's something that any of us can do in a family um, or as a professional. Any of us can do this to help somebody capture their memories. I raised three children who lost their mother and one of the things we did was we asked everyone who came to the funeral to write a letter to the boys describing some memory of their mother. And so all these people did this and we have this giant book of these letters that the kids would have never known these things about their mother because they weren't going to get a chance to know her as an adult. But because of other people's generosity and sharing the memories, they got to see her through the eyes of an adult and it, it gives them a chance to know her in a way they would not have known her otherwise. That's something we can all do. We can do that if you know someone who's lost a child or lost a mother or lost a sibling, sit down and write out your memory, one memory about that person and just send it. it those are treasures. So anything we can do to help adolescents, children, capture memories of, of your old school, of your person who died, of your dog, whatever it is, those are treasured gifts. And they, they mean a lot. Again, you're giving uh, adolescent a chance to rest their mind and to talk about the loss in a safe way. Another thing that we can do specific with adolescents is to invite meaning making, helping them to identify the ways in which the loss can make a difference in themselves, in others, in, in the world, at the school, in the community. And, you know, again, you have to, you can't just do this without knowing that particular child or adolescent or, or colleague or parent or whoever it is. But I have found that when people are ready to start thinking about how their experience is going to be transformative, they appreciate the chance to talk about, yeah, I want to educate people about suicide. I want to, I want to reach out to other siblings who have experienced the, their death of their father. Um, and that's something to keep in mind, but not rush into. But it is helping create a way to have a legacy for the person or the thing that is gone can be really powerful with adolescence. And it can be even as simple as, how are you different because this happened? Now, I know you wish it didn't happen, but it did. How are you different? And especially for people who have, are really struggling and really mired in their grief, being able to gently get to a point where, what kind of legacy do you think your sister would like to leave? Do you think the legacy of you being unable to get out of bed, <laughs> is that a legacy? And again, you have to be gentle with this and you have, they have to be ready. You have to have a relationship. But I think I would be, I think it would be missing something important not to at least mention that at some point inviting meaning making can be a very useful intervention, just not too soon. Encourage conversation is another technique for working with adolescents and kids, but also accepting silence. And we encourage conversation by building trusting relationships and asking questions and not being afraid to just talk about hard topics. Sometimes they want to talk and sometimes they don't, and that's totally fine. And then I think another thing that's important for helpers to do with kids is to foster and support and identify their resilience. So the American Psychological Association has a page on, on their website about building resilience and we'll provide a link to that. Lots of great ideas for how to build resilience and those are things we can work with kids. I think sometimes it can be really easy to focus on the deficits instead of building on those strengths. And if you can identify like, wow, look at you have this, you have great supports, you know, friends and this and that and being able to 
help to build resilience is a way to help people cope with really difficult things. I think this quote um, really kind of sums up what I think is important about how to work with people who are grieving. The friend who can be silent with us in a moment of despair or confusion, who can stay with us in an hour of grief and bereavement, who can tolerate not knowing, not healing, not curing, that is a friend who cares. When we're working with people who are grieving, including adolescents, the only way we can be effective is to be able to do an accurate assessment of what's going on. And that means we understand and recognize the impact of loss, that we know about grief, and that we understand about development. And that we see grief as a process that lasts a long time, longer than we expect that it should, and that grief will pop up again with time. Sometimes it'll pop up with a song, a date, and that we are most effective with teens and others when we build trusting relationships, when we don't try to fix it. The reality is we can't solve grief, we can't fix it, and we can't talk someone out of it, but that doesn't mean we can't make a difference. Thank you.